Uh, welcome. Uh, we're here with David Tenbaum in the beautiful uh, San Francisco Conservatory. And um, yeah, let's just start off uh, by asking you, David, um, could you tell us uh, when you started to play the guitar, like what was like sort of the, the initial moment when you decided to play, but also uh, more importantly, what, what kept you at it? Well, in my case, there was a moment, um, but I was doing music far before I found the guitar. I started according to my parents, singing Mozart on the swings when I was three. And so they started me with recorder lessons and then piano when I was five and cello when I was eight. And, you know, I kind of hit a rebellion at the ripe old age of 10 or 11, where I just, I remember actually going to a piano recital that I was going to play and I wasn't prepared enough. And I thought to myself, this is the last time I'll ever walk on a stage again. I just don't want to do this kind of thing. So I convinced them to let me take a year off, and the, my teacher agreed. My parents were both professional classical musicians, so it was in the culture of the house. So I took a year off, and I formed an electric band. And, you know, my dad was horrified, and he said, look, there's this guitarist coming who plays actual classical music on an actual, like, guitar that sounds better than your electric guitar. Let's go see him. So we went to a recital in, the, in a dead music uh, movie theater in New Rochelle, New York, where I'm from. And that was the moment. I mean, it was an enormous, enormous stage. And I don't know, a thousand people there and a chair and a footstool. And I couldn't believe, first of all, the drama of that before he came on. That it was just, there wasn't an instrument, it was just that. And then he just commanded it when he got on. And, I just remember like it was yesterday, first from the sound, how beautiful that sound was, how powerful his will was to make this kind of impossible acoustic situation work for that many people. And so the next day, I had heard him play the little D minor prelude that we play of Bach, but I didn't know, you know, I, I just thought, well, I'll just play it in the original key when I got it. I could hear that it was D, but I just thought, well, you probably just play it in C minor. And so I tried to work it out in C minor, and I clearly needed a, te needed a teacher for that. And that started me on the journey of getting teachers and, and doing this thing. Um, how did I continue? It wasn't ever really a question of not continuing. I mean, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I just did my first recital when I was 16, and I got a great gig when I was 17, touring around the United States and then Russia with the Joffrey Ballet, playing a Vivaldi concerto, not one of the lute ones we know, but a violin concerto arranged that they danced to in a ballet called Viva Vivaldi. So I did have work even when I was at uh, Peabody, um, but it, it, it just wasn't a question. It's never been a question. It's never been a thing I've regretted for a second. You know, I mean, as Virgil Thompson says, you know, life is full of disappointments and deceptions, but music never lets you down. And Hensa said to me, it's like the greatest ally you will ever have. He told me that when I was 20. He said, you know, just, it's the most powerful ally. You'll fall in love, you'll fall out of love, you'll have bumps and bruises, you'll have joy. Music's gonna be there. All true. Great, and so you uh, studied with uh, Aaron Shearer, is that right? Had, I did work with Aaron Shearer, and, and that was bumpy, because he was determined to change everything I was doing. And he spent basically the first year trying to break me down and saying, you know, you, you're doing this wrong and it's not, not gonna have longevity and this and that. And I was making 500 bucks a week with the Joffrey and that was pretty good money in those days, you know, in the 70s. Um, but I eventually figured that he was right. And so I went back for a second year and in that second year, I basically didn't play music. And it's essentially the only year of my life where I haven't played music. And it was the most miserable year of my life. Uh, I smoked pot, I smoked cigarettes, you know, which is to me way worse than pot, you know. Um, I did whatever I could to get through it. I was uh, real, you know, I was, had been really good friends with Manuel Barueco the first year. He then moved on. I actually got him the first job he got in Manhattan School of Music because my dad was teaching there, so he moved on. So I was kind of without my best friend there and um, it was hard, but Shira just made me basically just do strokes for, you know, a whole academic year just stroking, just basic things. In the long run, I'm happy I did it. 
and, and I fed myself musically by developing some friends who were into new music like I was and smoking dope and listening to great Stockhausen and new pieces that were out there. Um, and by March, I told Shira that I was going to leave, that I didn't feel like, you know, I could do this much longer. And I really expected him to come down heavily on me. And he said, you know, you've learned what I wanted to teach you. Just go out and assimilate it. So um, that was that. And then I met a female person and chased her out here and ended up in San Francisco, <laughs> um, married her and uh, finished. It was almost like a, a incidental. I was like, oh, I'll just come to the conservatory since I'm, I really just want to live with Julie. And, uh, I, and I finished my degree here just to kind of stay in school and finish the degree. And it's been like a lifetime association now. Yeah, so. <laughs> awesome. um, so since we were talking about San Francisco at this point, um, you're the, the chair of the guitar department here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, interestingly, we'd like to, to hear for us, um, when, how do you evaluate like, new students? Like, what are you looking for if people audition? Well, we obviously want to see what level they've attained. And we're looking for, you know, in some, some way, what discipline they've exhibited in attaining that. You know, are they good students? Can they really learn? You know, have they, have they really progressed? Um, we're not looking for per perfection at that point, but we are looking for a voice. And, you know, you sometimes get people who come and they, they don't miss a note, but it just, it doesn't feel like there's a voice there. And then you have to decide, is there one in there you can, you can bring out? Um, and so we look f for some of those qualities. I mean, there are departments that, you know, want to just create competition winners. We want to have a balance. I mean, we want to create those, and we have, and with Judicaio, we'll probably have more. But we also want to create sort of outside-the-box guitarists, like my former student, Gian Riley, who's the son of Terry, who does all kinds of, you know, non-classical things. Most of his life is improvising with other musicians. We have a group that we created called the Living Earth Show that has just played with Kronos last week. Things like that. Um, we, you know, I think we want to populate the world not just with solo competition winners, but with many different kinds of guitar players. So we look for that kind of potential in people as well. Are they doing really interesting things? Have they written an interesting essay? You know, um, we want to find out who the people are. Great. Well, that's interesting. Um, okay. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about your um, uh, early days, like touring schedule. I was very busy. You're the first person who ever, first guitarist to ever play in China. Uh, first, well, not first guitarist, but first one invited by the government, officially oh. invited by the government. Um, and that was kind of a long story. It was, it was a, you know, I guess it's one of the only government tours I've done, and it didn't, it, it was difficult, probably not worth telling the whole thing now, but, um, but it, you know, China's a fascinating place, and the guitar scene there now is just humongous. And um, I've been, you know, since, and will go this year again. Um, but I, I did tour, I have toured, I still tour. Um, and I, I would say, you know, in my touring life, I mean, I feel like there wasn't particularly one moment, maybe there was one moment more than the others, but there never was like, boom, you know, suddenly he's here. But there was, in 1986, when Henza wrote me a concerto, that all of a sudden I was popping up on all the magazine covers and I had many more concerts, especially in Europe. So that was definitely an acceleration of it. So I've always tried to balance, you know, the touring and the work here and, and raising a son who was born in 1992. Um, it was a balancing act. But, um, you know, I, I really like the touring. I like the traveling. I'm interested in places. There are colleagues of mine who just never go anywhere when they're, you know, they just go to the hotel, play the concert, go on. But I like to spend a little time and see where I am. And... Um, so I've developed friends, you know, in various places because of that. And um, I like it. Yeah. Great. You mentioned uh, um, uh, Werner Henze. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the, the creation process of this uh, concerto on the Eros Halter? Right. So <laughs> the story goes back till 1980. Uh, and I just got a call out of the blue. I was already doing quite a bit of new music and got a call from a singer who was putting together the first English language production of Henzer's great piece called El Cimarron, which is a, an, an evening-length uh, sort of theater piece for guitar, 
baritone, percussion, and flute. The guitarist in that piece plays about 10 percussion instruments and improvises and had, does some acting. Um, and it was an amazing thing to be involved in. We workshopped it for three months. I learned how to play percussion, studied it to be able to play that piece, and then we toured it. And uh, I remember particularly we toured at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in about a 2,500-seat hall. And there were probably 20 people in the audience all sitting in the balcony. You know, it just stands out in my memory because that was, we get out there and the entire orchestra is empty, you know, and then there are people up there. Anyway, so, uh, but we went, you know, we toured it quite a bit and uh, we played it in San Jose and Andrew Porter, who was the top New Yorker critic for many years, was doing a sort of a retrospective on the West Coast music scene and he came to the concert. And after he was really, you know, praising me, you know, in a very nice way. And after, he, I didn't know who he was, and somebody said, that was Andrew Porter. And so I thought, oh, I'll get it, maybe I can get a New Yorker review, which for a young artist is a great thing. So his articles on the West Coast scene came out, and they didn't include it. And I wrote to him, and I said, you know, you seem to like my performance, and, you know, can you tell me what's going on? Because I'd, I'd love to get a review from you if, if you want to write what you told me. And he said, no, I love, he wrote a beautiful letter back. He said, I loved what you did. I have told Henza about you, because he's my friend. And here's a letter that you can use with my name. So it was just a fantastic response. But even maybe a bigger key was I told Henza, who's my friend. So Henza then came uh, out to the Cabrillo Festival in Santa Cruz near here in 1983. And Royal Winter Music had come out, and I was studying it super hard, both sonatas. And there were many differences between the score and Breve's recording. And I wanted to just have his time and go over it with a fine tooth comb. So I kind of hung around the festival for about a week trying to find time. And he, you know, I introduced myself and he remembered that Andrew Porter had said it. And finally on a Sunday morning at the, the last day of the festival, he was having coffee and he said, come and play for me Royal Winter Music. So I went and, um, you know, it, he was sitting in his bathrobe drinking his coffee. It was a beautiful beautiful Sunday morning, California morning. I played the first movement and he said, wow, you understand this music perfectly, like that. Second movement, Romeo and Juliet, he said, stop for a second. I've come up with an idea. I will write you a concerto, like that. S just as quick as that. And, you know, elaborated on, you know, some things that he'd been thinking about during the second movement. And there were seven movements to go. So <laughs> it's like, okay, I don't want to blow this. I really didn't want that. I, I hadn't come for that. Of course, I wanted it. I hadn't come for that. I had come to work on the score. He just wanted to sit back and listen. So he followed through. I mean, how many older artists have promised a young artist something and not done it? But he organized the commission, and he got the great Ensemble Moderne in, uh, in, in Frankfurt, and we toured that. He wrote this piece called Anna and Eos Harfa, um, and we worked on it you know, substantially as he was writing it. Um, what I can report about that is... He had already written El Cimarron and he had written Royal Winter Music, you know, hours and hours of music, Camel Musique. And what I learned is that he didn't necessarily wanted to, want to write down to the finest detail. In other words, the last movement of that piece, he sent me 10 note chords. And he knew well that a 10 note chord couldn't work on the guitar. And he said, You make the chords, you make them. I like all these notes, just create some beautiful chords. I how did I decide? Yeah. Well, I, t I looked at the full score to see what you know, harmony was going on, and, and I saw what would fit, and I created them. So he, and, and, and he was essentially overwriting in quite a few places. He was trying to get a little more counterpoint mm -hmm. than was possible. So we did some reduction, but um, some addition in places as well. Um, the concept of the piece is that the guitar is the highest voice. He, like Lou Harrison, hated the uh, microphone. He said for him it was like you hear the instrument and then you hear the speaker and it's two different things. So he wanted the guitar to sound above 15 instruments. So he used no flutes, no violins, everything was kind of low in the ensemble and the guitar is often very high. It still doesn't quite work, you still have to amplify it. But it's a wonderful piece. And I did it with Henza conducting with other people, Bernhard Clay did the premiere and there's a conductor here named Nicole Pemont who loves the piece and we do it every few years together. It's a beautiful piece. Great. So that's that story. Awesome, awesome. And uh, the thing is, you know, once Henza wrote me a concerto, others of his colleagues wanted to say, oh, 
he wrote you a concerto, oh, maybe I'll write you something. You know, it's a lot easier when you have something like that. So. Yeah, it's a boost in credibility, I yeah. guess. You're known to, for, for, for pushing the, uh, the new contemporary music scene, <laughs> um, commissioning works, um, you know, giving incentive to younger composers, performers to perform new music. Just, just wondering, um, um, is there like a particular like reason for this like drive for you to express new sounds? I think it started early for me with the guitar. Mm -hmm. And it started, my dad was a composer who taught at Manhattan School of Music. I was telling you about that. Mm -hmm. And his concern when I found the guitar was the same as mine, which is that I love the sound so much, but I was not sure about the repertoire because you know, I had been playing Mozart and Beethoven and, you know, great things on the piano. And, um, you know, it just didn't feel like the repertoire was that great. I then got a copy of 20th Century Guitar by Brim, which was such a landmark recording. And that, you know, the Martin was on there and the Nocturnal, and that really pushed me into thinking there was a substantial repertoire. But I think what actually was the engine was one day I was in kind of those discussions with my dad, and one day I came home from high school and I went to practice and there was a new piece by him on my music stand. And I hadn't asked for it. So in a way it was almost too easy, the first one. But it was this beautiful piece called Music for Guitar. And I thought, wow, so you can make a repertoire. You know, it's not, you know, sort of already in print like what I thought the piano repertoire, but you can just make a repertoire. So that kind of got me started. And what's interesting is I'm doing um, concerts now of pieces written for me. I'm doing a CD of, I think, you know, some of the best pieces that I haven't gotten around to recording. I have a new Aaron Kernis piece, a new Sergio Saad piece, a Dushan Bogdanovich, and I'm going back and recording that piece of my dad's, which was in 1972. And I saw Oscar Gillia this summer in, in GFA for the first time in many years. And, you know, he's like 80 years old, and he walked up to me and he said, are you still working on that piece for your father that you were working on in Aspen in 1973? <laughs> and he remembered that from 44 years ago. And I said, actually, Oscar, yes. I hadn't worked on it in the interim, but I am actually playing it again. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I think that piece gave me almost like a false sense of confidence. Like, wow, I just hang out and pieces show up in your music stand. And, and I loved it. I loved like a living piece where I could say to my dad, you know, you made a mistake here. Let's change this note. So I was involved in the creative process. You know, I'm not a creator in the sense of that I can deal with a blank page and I write music. I just don't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of like the actor who needs a script. But this is my way to be creative, to, to work with composers and, and mold their pieces to the instrument. Great. Huh? Awesome. So um, uh, before we talk about this, interesting collection of instruments. Um, one final question is, um, what kind of a core philosophy do you seek to ingrain in your students when they're here in time being with you before they go out and do their thing? Well, I mean, obviously, as I mentioned, when we're auditioning them, we want really to find their voice. And we want to help them develop the courage to perform and bring that out. And um, so what I'm trying to do with this department is to create a kind of fertile soil where there are many places to grow. Like we have a early music program run by Rich Savino. And so they can, we have lutes and Baroque guitars and we have two theorbos and they can really have an emphasis in early music. And a lot of them even just come out of here, do their final juries and never play the guitar again. They just play early music. But we have, that th we have that here. We've had Sergio who was working with them sometimes on arranging and composing. Um, you know, just different areas like that. We now have a jazz program and Julian Lodge, who's a brilliant young jazz player, is doing a whole series of classes on improvising for classical players throughout this year. Um, you know, so we, we want to make a, a place where they don't just have to all do this kind of cookie cutter, you know, got to play the competition repertoire and win competitions, which is fine, but it's not for everybody. I mean, your teacher, Ben, I'm not, I don't think he ever did a competition. And look at how creative he is and how brilliant his career has been. Yeah. So there are just different ways to go. And we'd like to encompass it all. And, and we very much feel like a lot of the education happens not just in the studio in that hour a week, 
but in going to concerts together, in discussing things together, in having just different workshops and events where we explore different aspects of our field. That's awesome. So. That's super interesting. Um, okay, so let's uh, uh, turn to our uh, guitar talk a little bit. And um, so could you just, just give us like an overview of like, the equipment you use, like strings, guitars, um, how that maybe changed over time, and then can you tell us a little bit of, about those beautiful guitars behind us? Okay, so I own six guitars. I, own, I have two Friedrichs who I revere. I, I think, well, he's retired now, but I think he was, personally, I think he was the greatest living luthier. Um, and those instruments are just magnificent. I can't speak too highly of them. They're just great. Um, I have a Connor, which is probably the guitar I'm playing the most, and you saw that today. Um, and I love that for its millennial, millennium, you know, the, the Humphrey system. It's a 640 scale, which I just love. The, the extra, you know, it's just easier to stretch. It's got a sound port. It's very American. It's like a stew of all the, you know, the stuff that's out there. Friedrich, you know, I had to really work hard to get him to make me a 20th fret, but he wouldn't do any of this stuff. He was a more traditional maker. Um, anyway, so I have those three. I have a Humphrey, which I love, um, and I'm playing... There's a Dushan Bogdanovich piece I mentioned that he wrote for me. I'm playing that out in Sacramento in a couple of weeks. And it's a dadgad tuning, so I'm bringing an extra guitar. I'll play that on the Humphrey. Um, and then I have a Gary Southwell, which has internal amplification, which right now I keep in New York because I'm in New York a lot. And I keep it at my brother's house in New York. But I use that sometimes for chamber music, um, sometimes for concertos. Um, and then I have the Lou Harrison guitar. And the Lou Harrison guitar is a national steel modified into just intonation, um, used for his very, very last piece, the last completed piece, which he wrote for me you know, about a year before he died. Mm -hmm. And I play that piece on there, and then also Terry Riley was so taken by the instrument that he wrote like a 20-minute anti-Iraq war piece in 2003 um, as well. Mm -hmm. So... And there are now, you know, maybe 20 pieces for that instrument. So I actively play that as well. I use D'Addario strings, uh, both steel and nylon. Mm -hmm. um, mostly normal tension. Um, once in a while, I'll put a set of Augustine on the Friedrichs because I think they, Friedrich always said, I like Augustine on my guitars. And so I once in a while do that. But I'm, I'm a D'Addario player. Um, and I have the Barnett guitar support, which is now called Stage Work guitar mm -hmm. support, which has the magnets and the, I, you know, I've never had a back pain. I mean, I, you know, I've been doing this, I've been professional over 40 years and I've never had a back pain. 45 years. <laughs> but I just love having both feet on the floor. And so, you know, just in the rehearsal of the Adams a couple of hours ago, there I was playing with it. I just, I find it to be the most stable one. Mm -hmm. You know, I've tried the cushion and the ergo play. They're all great in their own ways, but I like stability when I'm out there. And so I do use that. And those are mostly my toys, you know. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about this. So, you know, I would say as part of the core philosophy, we're trying to encourage innovation here, but also honor tradition. And so this is the honor tradition part. And we want these students to have kind of a, a palpable experience of these magnificent old instruments. Mm -hmm. And John Harris is a collector. Uh, he's been collecting for quite a while. He sort of started collecting when he got involved with one guitar sale somehow with Pepe Romero. And he's very good friends with the Romeros and made a PBS documentary about them. Um, and so uh, he, we have a, he has a, a, a Harris Foundation and I'm on the board of that. It has representation from John Harris's family and conservatory members and also the Omni Foundation, which has the big series here. So we want to combine our efforts in the guitar world here. And um, these instruments are playable. They're in great shape. And Pepe Romero, when we dedicated this, this display cabinet, he said, each of these instruments is a teacher. There are 14 teachers here. Mm -hmm. And I think he was right about that. So they're just magnificent. And John comes in, and he does thematic sessions. Like last week, on Wednesday, he did a session on the, on the Ramirez dynasty. So that's Jose and Manuel, you know. And, and he brought in, you know, a bunch of Ramirez's. Um, and we try to also uh, align his workshops with the curriculum. So I'm teaching a modern lit rep class in the, in the spring. Mm -hmm. 
And when I'm talking about Segovia, he's going to do a session on Segovia guitars. He's got a Manuel Ramirez from 1913, which is the year Manuel Ramirez gave Segovia his first great guitar. So the kids can hear about the, rep you know, the history and the repertoire and come down and play the instruments that those were played on. And when I get to Bream in the class, he's going to bring in Rubio's and, and Bream guitars. So it's a lot of work, but it's, it's trying to coordinate the educational experience so they get some kind of holistic and experiential, uh, you know, well, experience of, this, of these instruments and this, this field. Great. And how yeah. long have you been, uh, has this collection been going on? Well, it, the collection itself, in terms of John having it, has been more than 20 years. But we just, we worked for five years with lawyers and everything to make this agreement and build this display case. And this is, in April will be the third year it's been here. Oh, wow. So it hasn't been forever. But there have been some greats in this room. Andy Summers was here and, you know, many of the fine touring guitarists have come to play these as they, as they tour by, you know, David Russell, you know. The big names come and want to play these instruments. Could you name a few? What, what, do, we, what do we got here? Well, we have, I mean, and he, John rotates. There are different instruments depending on some of his sessions. But, I mean, this is a Herman Hauser one. Um, and this is, it's hard to read, 1948. You have an Esteso next to it. It says it was an amazing Spanish maker on the top there. Um, and, you know, just picking a few out, um, there's a Jose Ramirez III, and these are still hanging from last week's session. There's a David Jose Rubio. You probably know the story that uh, David Rubio became Jose Rubio because it sounded more like a Spanish guitar maker's name. There's a Miguel Rodriguez. This is the instrument uh, that was owned by Angel Romero. I kind of feel like if you just pick that up, it starts playing the, the Aranjuez for you. You don't even have to do much, you know. It's played it so many times. Um, and we have also always a contemporary lute player, a living one, uh, and so in there is Randy Angela. Um, and that's in this part of the cabinet. And this rotates every three months or so. Um, Randy is played by Jorge Caballero and some other fine players. Michael Lorimer has a number of his guitars. So the Taurus is not there right now. You can see some of these labels some of the other ones that exist in the collection, and, and John rotates them some, but, okay. yeah. Well, all right, thank you so much for the, for the, the tour of this amazing uh, instrument, and thank you so much for your time, and see you next time. A pleasure. Good thank luck you. with Tone Bass. Thanks. <laughs>